We will touch on muscle hypertrophy, muscle growth, and building big muscles, as well as improving muscle strength. We will mainly be talking about muscle as it relates to the nervous system. If your goal is to build larger muscles, there's a way to use your nervous system to trigger hypertrophy, to increase the size of those muscles. So there's an important principle of muscle physiology called the that's when you start to get changes in the muscle. That's when you open the gate for the potential for the muscles to get stronger and to get larger. You can forget the idea that the muscles have memory or that muscles grow in response to something that's just happening within the muscle. It's the... So when you hear the science of muscle and muscle hypertrophy, you might think, oh, well, I'm not interested in building muscle, but muscle does many critical things. It's important for movement. It's important for metabolism. The more muscle you have, and not just muscle size, but the quality of muscle, that's a real thing, the higher your metabolism is, and indeed the healthier you are. In addition, muscle and musculature is vital for posture. And we don't talk about posture enough. We all have been told we need to sit up straight or stand up straight, but posture is vitally important for how the rest of our body works. It's vital to how we breathe. It's actually even vital to how alert or sleepy we are. We also are going to talk about muscle as it relates to aesthetic things. As our posture changes, our aesthetic changes. As our posture and aesthetic changes, how we move changes. And as we improve muscle quality, whether or not that's increasing muscle size or not, that changes the way that our entire system, not just our nervous system and our muscular system, but our immune system and the other organs of the body work. So there are a lot of reasons to use resistance exercise that extend far beyond just the desire to increase muscle size. Because I know many of you are interested in increasing muscle size, but many of you are not. It's really exciting is that in just the last three years or so, there's been a tremendous amount of information to come out about the practical steps that one can take in order to maximize the benefits of resistance exercise of any kind. There's a lot of information saying that you need to move weights that are you know, 80 to 90% of your one rep maximum or 70% or cycle that for three weeks on and then go to more moderate weights. There, there are a lot of paths. As, um, as some people say, there are a lot of ways to, to add up numbers to get 100. And what's very clear now from all the literature that's transpired, and especially from the literature in this last three years, is that once you know roughly your one repetition maximum, the, the maximum amount of weight that you can perform an exercise with for one repetition in good form, full, full range of motion, that it's very clear that moving weights or using bands or using body weight, for instance, in the 30 to 80% of one rep maximum, that is going to be the most beneficial range in terms of muscle hypertrophy and strength. So muscle growth and strength. Now it is clear, however, that one needs to perform those sets to failure where you can't perform another repetition in good form again or near to failure. So we can make this simple, perform anywhere from five to 15 sets of resistance exercise per week and that's per muscle and that's in this 30 to 80% of what your one repetition maximum. That seems to be the, the most scientifically supported way of offsetting any decline in muscle strength if you're working in the kind of five set range and in increasing muscle strength when you start to get up into the 10 and 15 set range. I do want to mention something very important, which is that everything I'm referring to here, it has to do with full range of motion, okay? And you might ask, well, what about the speeds of movements? This is actually turns out to be a really interesting data set. Think about a set in the gym or think about a set of push-ups or a set of pull-ups. Initially, you can move very fast if you like. If you want to generate hypertrophy, the goal really is not necessarily to move super slow, but to isolate the muscle and therefore not to use momentum rather than lift weights, as they say, challenge muscles. If you want to get stronger, you're going to be distributing that effort over more muscles and more of your nervous system. As long as you're not moving the muscle so quickly that you start to distribute the effort to lots of other muscles, it doesn't really matter because as the, the set gets harder, the motor units that you recruit will increase, the number of neurons that you recruit and the number of muscle fibers, and particularly these high threshold muscle fibers will increase. And so it's really only for purposes of hypertrophy that you really need to be concerned about how quickly the weight is slowing down. In an earlier episode, I talked about 
estrogen and testosterone. And during that discussion, I talked about the use of resistance exercise specifically for increasing testosterone, both in men and in women. And indeed, that is a powerful effect of resistance exercise. And indeed, it's mediated by the nerve to muscle connections. We talked about that in that earlier episode. I just want to briefly mention that protocol since it's distinctly different from the other protocols I've talked about today. The protocols I've talked about today thus far of hypertrophy based training, provided the training is 60 minutes or less will cause increases in serum testosterone that's been shown over and over again. And if the session extends too long past 75 minutes and is of sufficiently high intensity, chances are testosterone levels will start to drop and cortisol levels will go up in ways that can be detrimental to recovery and the goals of the training. But that's different than training that's specifically geared toward increasing testosterone. And that involved doing six sets of 10 repetitions, even if it requires lightening the weight on one set to the next with about two minutes, 120 seconds rest in between sets, which if you think about it is pretty short rest and is pretty darn hard work. Now, what's interesting is that there's a very limited threshold for increasing testosterone. That protocol of six sets of 10 repetitions led to these big increases in serum testosterone. But if people did 10 sets of 10, so just four more repetitions per set, then testosterone did not increase. In fact, you got more of this catabolic cortisol-like pathway. You get other benefits from the so-called 10 sets of 10 protocol, but not the testosterone increase and maybe even reductions in testosterone. Now, it's important to point out that that six sets of 10 was done with big compound movements. So things like squats or deadlifts or chin-ups or things of that sort. And those were done as single sessions, not in concert with a bunch of other exercise. Although if athletes are doing that, there's no reason why they couldn't also do other types of training elsewhere in the week. Another thing that Andy Galpin's group is testing is at the offset of training, after your run, after your weight training session, they and other groups, including some elite athletes, and other groups that are very interested in physical performance are using a tool where they deliberately disengage for five minutes at the end of training. They deliberately engage this calming or parasympathetic arm of the nervous system. And you can do that through any number of different tools. I'm a big fan of respiration tools because they're always available to you. Your breathing is always there. I talk about some of these tools in previous episodes, but you could use things like non-sleep deep rest and SDR at the end of a training session. You could do 10 physiological size, double inhales through the nose, followed by long exhales that will definitely engage the parasympathetic nervous system at the end of training. So rather than finish your training session and then just hop onto your phone, serious athletes and people who are serious about recovery initiate that recovery. I know several groups because I'm working with them that are using physiological size between sets in order to recover their nervous system and maintain nerve to muscle contractibility, maintain focus throughout their training session, enhance their focus by doing a few physiological size. So double inhale, exhale in between sets. So they're getting very focused and very intense about their strength work or explosiveness work or muscle isolation work during their sets. And then in between sets, they're deliberately disengaging the nervous system and then they're re-engaging it again. 